Hey, Ryan, on the left-hand side, there's a thing that says second service, left-hand side. Click that one and go to that. Put Grace alone up there for me, buddy. You see it? There it is. All right. Well, good morning, church. So excited to see y'all here again with us as we uh, start off with worship. We're going to ask you to stand. Please have a seat. Uh, my name is Aaron Kaler, and I serve as one of the pastors here. And I want to welcome you to this gathering of the Hayes Hills Baptist Church. If you're our guest this morning, I want to encourage you to grab one of the Connect cards that's there in the seat in front of you. And you can grab it out of that pocket. And on that card, you can jot down just a little information about yourself. And we'd ask that you place that in the offering plate when it's passed later in the service as your gift to us today. And it allows myself or another member of our staff to be able to reach out to you this week, answer any questions you have about the church, but most importantly, uh, be able to hear about you and your family, uh, how we can best serve and care for you at this time. And so I, I hope that you will do us that kindness by uh, filling out one of the Connect cards, placing it in the offering uh, later in the service this morning. 
Our uh, missions partner of the week uh, are the Armand family, Matt and Brianna Armand, their children. Uh, they serve as Bible translators in the Himalayas. And um, the advocacy team leader for the Armands is one I'm, I'm fond of. It's my wife, uh, Lindsay, here. And so um, if, if you've been here for a while and you see we always have a missions partner of the week, we have these things we call advocacy teams. And you're saying, what is that about? Uh, we have teams for each and every one of our major missions partnerships uh, that gather once a month to be able to pray with and for our uh, missionaries on the field, be able to seek ways to encourage them over the next uh, 30 days. And so if you're looking for a way to get involved in uh, taking the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the unreached and the unengaged, I would encourage you uh, to join one of our mission advocacy teams. It takes about 45 minutes a month. Uh, it's a very low-cost investment with a very high yield, a very high uh, return on that investment. And so you can see Lindsay's uh, email information there. In fact, we're, we're going to uh, be gathering to pray for the Armands at 2 o'clock today via Zoom. And so if you'd like to be a part of that call, you can email her, and she'll send you the link to be able to join that conversation. Um, I, I was so glad over uh, vacation I received word from Matt, and uh, many of you will remember uh, that early on in COVID, we, the police raided their home uh, where they were. Uh, it was kind of a scary situation. We had, to, we had an emergency where we had to get them out of the country they were in, uh, back to the States very quickly. And, um, and so thank you for your generous giving that made that possible. Um, but there have just been a lot of discouragements over the last 18 months for them. But Matt emailed me while I was away on vacation and said, hey, can, I just need somebody to rejoice with. Uh, would you rejoice with me? And um, as we prayed, have been praying over the past couple of months, they've completed the Psalms in the S language group. And he's begun translating the book of Joshua for the S language group. And then he's been called in uh, to check the translation of Proverbs for the R language group. And uh, in the process of that, he went to update their uh, scripture app, which uh, being a Bible translator these days involves uh, a lot of work on apps uh, to make the scripture accessible. And when he went into the Google Play Store, um, he found that the R language group's uh, scripture app is currently simultaneously downloaded on 1,800 devices. And to give you perspective uh, when they started, there were less than 200 believers among the R language group. And now we've got 1,800 devices with the Bible scripture app that they've developed on um, their tablets, on their smartphones. And so just rejoicing in what the Lord has done. And thank you, Hayes Hills, for investing and making that possible. And I want to ask you to pause and pray with me for the Armands and for the peoples they're working among. Lord, we thank you for... Um, Matt and Brianna, we thank you for their family. We thank you for their sacrifice to uh, get the scriptures into the heart language of the peoples of the Himalayas. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the good news of uh, these 1,800 devices that have the R language group scripture app downloaded onto them. We pray that they would read the scriptures, that their lives would be changed through the scriptures, through your Holy Spirit working in them. Uh, Lord, we pray that there would be disciples made among the peoples. And Lord, we thank you for the great privilege we have to be a part in that through our giving, through our praying with and for the Armands, our relationship that seeks to encourage them and spur them on in love and good works. We pray for the advocacy team as they meet today at 2 p.m. We ask that, uh, Lord, those present on the call would uh, be able to lift their requests on behalf of the Armands up to you and that you would uh, work through that process to uh, bring about your will being done on earth as it is in heaven. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Would you stand with us as we continue to sing praise to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Beneath the flood 
I hope you can say that this morning, that you are saved. I'd like you to join us in this next call called Nothing But the Blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Please have a seat. Uh, we're going to have an opportunity to observe the Lord's Supper together this morning. And I don't know about you, but um, there are many things in my life that I would forget to do, that I would fail to do if it weren't for alarms set on my phone. And uh, if there's something that has to get done, set an alarm, it's going to go off. I'm going to remember, oh yeah, I was supposed to do that. And the Lord's Supper is... It's kind of like that. Uh, Jesus has instituted this meal that we're going to partake of here in just a couple of minutes as something of a, a reminder to each and every one of us of a number of things. That as a church, we would regularly partake of the Lord's Supper and be reminded first and foremost that Jesus has entered into the world. Uh, Jesus lived the perfect life that we needed. He died the death we deserve. It's a reminder that if you belong to him, if you've put your hope and your trust in him, all your sin, all your guilt, all your shame, it has been erased through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's a reminder that you're no longer at enmity with God, that, that you are welcome at the Lord's table. You are in a right relationship with the creator of the universe. It's a reminder that Jesus is returning for his people. He, he says, hey, as, as long as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. 
And then one of, the, one of the aspects of the Lord's Supper that I think is often overlooked is that it's a reminder that we are called to be engaged in the work of evangelism. The Lord's Supper isn't just an inward reflection about my personal relationship with Jesus Christ. As we take the supper, we proclaim the fact that Jesus has come, that he has lived, that he has died, that he has risen from the dead. The, the Lord's Supper is a call to the church to be about the business of declaring to one another and to the watching world that our Lord rules, he reigns, and he saves. And so I, I pray that as we partake of the supper this morning, it would serve as, as a reminder of sorts in your life, may, maybe of some of these things that, that you've lost sight of. And so in just a moment, uh, the brothers are going to uh, distribute the elements. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, uh, this is a meal for you. Uh, the Bible tells us that the Lord's Supper is for all of those who have put their hope and trust in Jesus. If, if you're here this morning and you're still trying to figure out what you believe about Jesus, man, we are so glad you are here today. And we would encourage you to simply let the, the elements pass, pass them on to the next person and not partake this morning. Nobody's going to think anything less of you, but it is intended to be a reminder to you that you have unfinished business with the Lord. That, that you are not yet welcome at the Lord's table. And I know that may sound so harsh to you, like how could God who is good and loving, how would he not want me of all people at his table? But our God, he is a God of goodness and grace and mercy, but he is also a God of justice. And the Bible teaches us that when we have sinned against him and we all have, we are put in enmity with him. The relationship is not right. And it is only through trust in his son, Jesus Christ, and through his blood that you can be reconciled to him. And so this meal serves as a reminder to you that the Lord wants you to be seated at his table, but you cannot be until you put your hope and your trust in Jesus. We pray you would do that today. And so the, the elements are going to be passed. It's a little tricky. There's a very thin plastic layer on the top that you'll peel back first to expose uh, the cracker, the wafer. We'd encourage you, once you get that, you can begin peeling back that first plastic layer, and then we'll give further instructions. But would you first take some time to pray with me uh, that the Lord would bless this time of observance. Lord, we thank you for the gift of the Lord's Supper. We thank you that uh, you have installed it into the schedule of worship of your people, that we might be reminded of these realities, that you have entered into the world, you have died to take the punishment for our sin, that you have, you have erased our guilt and our shame, that Lord, we belong with you and have union with Christ. Lord, that because of you, we have a hope for the future, that you will return and that we will rise to live with you forevermore. And Lord, that because all of these things are true, you have called us to be active and engaged in evangelism, speaking to those around us of the good news of the gospel. And so we pray in all of these many ways we would be reminded of these things. And it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.
and take that thin plastic layer, peel it back. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you for the body of Jesus. We thank you that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We thank you that Jesus, the one who created all things, the one who sustains all things, the one in whom all things hold together, was willing to enter into the world to be born as a baby who was then dependent upon others to to change his diaper and to feed him. Lord, it is hard to envision that level of condescension, that kind of humility. And Lord, I pray for those who are gathered here who still have the taste of that wafer in their mouth, Lord, that they would be reminded that as they face difficult things in their life, Lord, as they're discouraged, as as they don't understand Lord, how they're going to make it this week or this month or this year. Lord, if they're struggling to, to, to see your goodness and, Father, have been doubting it at some level in their heart, I pray that they would be reminded through this meal that, Lord, the body of Jesus has been broken for them. And that if you, Father, did not spare your own son, but graciously uh, gave him up for us all, how will you also not uh, with him and through him graciously give us all things? And so, Father, I pray with that knowledge that they would be confident that they can trust you to provide for them tomorrow and next week and, Lord, for all of their lives. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Next, you can take that thicker layer, and peel it back. The Apostle Paul writes next of of the cup, he says, in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us. Lord, we thank you that it is his blood that washes away our sins. Lord, I pray for those gathered here this morning who, uh, Lord, uh, struggle perhaps with tendencies of self-harm, cutting, uh, trying to to dull the pain of this world, or maybe uh, trying just to feel something themselves, and, and the only way they can come up with to do that is to shed their own blood. And Lord, I pray that as the taste of this drink still lingers in their mouths, they would be reminded that the only way that this world can bring joy to them, the only way that they can find hope and satisfaction is not through the shedding of their blood, but through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we have entered into a new covenant that is not based on the good things that we do, our good works, Lord, our status with you is not based on our own personal performance, but, Lord, that we have entered into a new covenant that is based entirely on what Jesus has done for us. And so, Lord, I pray for those this morning who maybe have entered into church a little sheepishly, feeling like uh, they're in the penalty box or that you're not pleased with them or, uh, Father, that you have cast your face away from them because of something that they have done, that, Lord, as this drink lingers in their mouth, they would be reminded that because of the blood of Jesus, they have entered into a new covenant and that, Lord, you love them and you care for them, not based on who they are and what they have done, but on who, because of who Jesus is and what he has done. 
And Lord, it is in his name and by the power of the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. I want to ask you to, to stand and join me in reading our congregational psalm for this morning. It comes from the 115th psalm. We're going to read together verses 2 through 8. Would you read with me? Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak, eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear, noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel, feet, but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. It's God's word to us today. You may be seated. This time, kids, K through 5th, are dismissed to attend children's worship if they would like to do so. As always, children are welcome in our services, but we have this time of child-focused instruction in the word of God and in the love of Jesus Christ if you want to take advantage of it. I rarely post on social media Every now and then, church members will send me a friend request or try to get linked up with me on social media, and I try to accept those requests, but I think they're going to be really disappointed because I don't post much. So I guess that kind of makes me the creepy guy who just lurks back in the shadows and watches what everybody else is doing. Um, but, But one of the reasons I still scroll through social media is that it allows me to to take the temperature of the culture. It lets me know what people value, lets me know what people are thinking. And while we were away on vacation, we were sitting in an airport uh, waiting to get on a plane, and I was scrolling through, and I saw uh, someone I'm associated with post this. They said, hey, give me your hottest take. What do you think the purpose of life is? And, like, that's, (laughs) that's an important question. That's a fundamental question. It's not one of those like highfalutin philosophical questions left to be answered by the elites in academia. That's the sort of philosophical question we all ask. It's the sort of philosophical question we all have to answer because it determines the course of our very lives. What do you believe the purpose of life is? And people were quick to answer in the comment. Uh, A lot of people said something like this, you know, well, there is no purpose in life. It's all just chaos. In fact, one one person said, uh, you know, we got here by chaos and chance, and it's a bit depressing to me at times, but there's really no purpose in life. But I also find that a bit liberating because it means I can do really whatever I want. Others, uh, not wanting to admit that there's no purpose in life, they, they would answer this way. They, uh, they, uh, they would say, and I think this was probably the most common answer, was uh, the, the purpose in life is whatever you want it to be. You know, you, you just choose what you want your purpose in life to be, and you run after that with all the energy you have. In fact, one person added, they said, hey, if somebody else is telling you that the purpose of life is something else than that, I don't know why you wouldn't just choose to function as if the purpose in life is whatever you want it to be. And that sounds really good, doesn't it? I mean, it sounds really liberating. And it is until you start extending that freedom to people other than yourself. Because once you start extending that freedom to to let each person choose whatever they want their purpose in life to be, it becomes morally unsatisfactory very quickly. I mean, if the Taliban decides that the purpose of life is to destroy America, that's going to be their purpose. How can you argue with that? Like, they're just, they're just being who they want to be. They're saying, look, this is what we see as our purpose. Our purpose can be whatever we want it to be. We're just doing us. You do you. And so other people, they tried to dodge that a little bit, and they said, well, the purpose in life is to leave the world a better place. But that doesn't, that doesn't really help, because who gets to determine what better is? 
I mean, I promise you, if you were to ask me, what does it look like to leave the world a better place, and you were to ask a member of the Taliban, what does it look like to leave the world a better place, you're going to get drastically different answers. And so who has the authority to determine what better is? Again, it's satisfactory as long as you're king of the universe and you get to determine what better is. And so uh, other people, they said, you know, um, here, here's, here's the real answer. The purpose in life is to enjoy life to the best of your ability without harming anyone else. That sounds like a nice caveat, but who gets to determine if someone is being harmed? You remember the days of blockbuster video? Some of you don't, and you're like, what's that dinosaur? But, but, you know, we used to go into these places, and they had walls filled with movies, you know, and you'd spend like an hour, you know, trying to decide which movie you want. You'd pick up the physical VHS or the physical DVD that you wanted, and you'd take it back home, and you'd watch it. And then Netflix arrived on the scene. And when that happened, I'll tell you, a lot of blockbuster franchisees were harmed. Their livelihoods disintegrated. And if you say, oh, that's not what it means, you know, live life however you want as long as you don't harm, no one would ever consider that harm. Well, just look at what happened in the news this week. I mean, if you paid attention to the news, France pulled their ambassador to the United States this week. Why? Well, because we entered, the, the U.S. and the U.K. entered into a deal with Australia to provide them nuclear submarines. And when we entered into that deal, Australia canceled their deal with France that was constructing them traditional subs. And France is so upset about this, they're, they're saying, look, this is just typical Americans thinking about only themselves. They don't care about us. We're, this is an enormous financial loss for us. And they're so angry, they recalled their ambassador because they say, we've been harmed. And even if you say, well, look, they're just acting like children, that, 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 you know, nobody would really think that way still. It's only if you do bodily harm, physical harm to someone. Well, does that mean I can choose that my purpose in life is to be an arsonist or a thief and burn all your stuff or steal all your stuff as long as I don't harm you bodily, physically? And so I got to tell you, none of the options people presented in the comments, I don't find any of them morally satisfactory. But the Bible offers a different answer to that most fundamental question, what is the purpose of life? And I find the Bible's answer to that question not only morally satisfying, I find it personally fulfilling. And so if you're the kind of person who, maybe you're struggling with maybe like some low-grade depression right now, or maybe just a sort of despondency, because you just say, man, I'm not sure that anything I do matters. Or, or maybe you're the kind of person who's just searching for like, hey, what is my life supposed to be about? Like, what am I supposed to be doing? I want to invite you to turn with me to the opening pages of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1 as we look at the, the Bible's answer to this most fundamental question, what is the purpose of life? And I'm going to begin reading this morning there in Genesis chapter 1 in verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And the grass withers and the flower, <laughs> the flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. And this is God's word to us today. And here in these verses, I want you to see that your purpose, according to the Bible, your purpose is to show and spread the glory of God. 
And some of you, you're sitting there and you're saying, look, if, that, if that's the Bible's answer to what the purpose of my life is, that sounds really lame. I don't understand why I would want that to be the purpose in my life. I, I just want to let you know, I understand that concern. I'm going to try to answer that in a bit. But before I can answer that sort of objection, that kind of question, I first need to show you what these verses mean and why I'm, I'm kind of summarizing the Bible's answer to this question, what is the purpose of your life this way? To show and to spread the glory of God. Then we'll come back around and I promise I'll answer what's in it for me, all right? So why have I summarized it this way, that, that your purpose is to show and spread the glory of God? Well, first I want you to see in these verses that we are told that we have been created in the image of God. We have been created in the image of God. Uh, God says it in verse 26, again in the first poem in Scripture in verse 27. We have been created in God's image. And that may be a bit confusing to you because you look around the room and none of us look alike. And so you're saying, well, which one of us looks like God? You know, is it me? Is it, is it him? Is it the person two rows in front of you? Because we tend to think of the Bible speaking of God in anthropomorphic language, that the, the Bible attributes to God human characteristics that he doesn't really possess. But what the Bible teaches here in Genesis 1 and what we read in Psalm 115 just a few moments ago is that rather than the Bible speaking of God in anthropomorphic language, you and I are theomorphic creatures. We have been created in the image of God. And that means that you have eyes, not because God has eyes, but because our God is a God who sees. And you have ears, not because God has ears, but because our God is a God who hears. And you have a mouth because our God is a God who speaks. You have hands because our God is a God who acts. The, 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 the images of the false gods, the idols made out of silver and gold, they have eyes, but they do not see. Ears, but they do not hear. Mouths, but they do not speak. But not the images of the one true God, not you and me who have been created in his image. We show the world what our God is really like, that he sees, he hears, he speaks, he acts. And so when you interact with me and when I interact with you, I come to know something of God's glory. You show God's glory through your body. But you also show God's glory through your behavior. In these verses, we're told to, to care for the earth. Why? Well, because God cares for all things. We're told to have dominion, to rule over the earth. Why? Because God rules over all things. And so, some of you are incredibly creative, whether it's composing music or composing literature, composing a painting. Now, why do you think that is? Well, it's because the God in whose image you have been created, created all things. And so every time you display your creativity through, uh, you know, music or literature or a painting, it's actually an act of worship. Because as you display your creativity, you are displaying the creativity of the God in whose image you've been created. You show God's glory through your body and your behavior. We've been created in the image of God. But secondly, I want you to see in these verses that we are to multiply in order to demonstrate God's majesty. In verse 28, we're told, be fruitful and multiply. He, God wants uh, people to have children, to multiply, so that there are more images of him on the earth. Why? Well, some of you are familiar with the 21-gun salute. You know, you, you honor a dignitary, you fire 21 guns. But in Denmark, if you're the head of state, you get 21 guns. If you're what they call a majesty, that is the king or the queen, majesty, your majesty, you get 27-gun salute. More guns, more honor, more majesty. Uh, in India, during the time of the empire, they had an entire system uh, from a one-gun salute, which I, I imagine would be kind of pathetic, right? You show up and boom, you know, one gun. If you're the head of state, you get 21 guns. If you're the empress, you got 31. If you were the emperor, 101 guns. 
In the United States today, 21 guns. If you're the president, if you're the vice president, you show up only 19. Sorry, buddy. Why? More guns, more majesty. In the same way, God is saying, hey, you ought to multiply. My images ought to multiply in order to demonstrate the level of my majesty. But not only are we to multiply, I want you to see here, we're also to spread we're, we're to spread, to show, to demonstrate the sphere of God's sovereignty. Notice there in verse 28, uh, God blesses them. God says to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. In other, in other words, God says, you don't just multiply where you are. You've got to spread out in order to demonstrate the sphere of God's sovereignty. If you were to visit Washington, D.C. today, you'd find a large statue that looks like Abraham Lincoln. It's created in his image. It's the Lincoln Memorial. And that image, that monument's been created to show the world his greatness, that, hey, he was a great leader, great ruler, great figure in our country's history, and so we've created this image, this monument to him. But it's in D.C., you won't find a Lincoln Memorial in China. You won't want find one in Germany. You won't find one in France. Why not? Because Lincoln wasn't the ruler of those countries. He was the president of the United States. His image is in the United States. It's there in D.C. But God, how much of the world is he sovereign over? How much of the earth does he rule and reign? All of it. And so God says, you not only need to multiply, you not only need to be fruitful and multiply, you need to spread out, you need to fill the earth in order to demonstrate the sphere of my sovereignty, that I rule and reign over all things. And so that's our purpose. That, that's what you were created to do, to show and spread the glory of God. But you don't have to turn very far in your Bibles. Like you just probably flip a page or two over in your Bible to Genesis chapter 3 and you will find that sin has frustrated our purpose. Uh, the first people, Adam and Eve, created in God's image to show and spread the glory of God, they chose to trust in something other than God's word. The Bible calls that sin. And because of that, sin not only entered into their human hearts, it also entered into the world and broke creation itself. And so that's the reason we experience things like infertility and miscarriage and death. And the reason these things are so painful, the, the reason infertility and miscarriage is so painful, if you've ever experienced it, the, the way like my family has experienced these things, it's painful because not only are you grieving loss, it is striking at the very purpose for which you were created. And you know, like, hey, my purpose is to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and, and it's not happening. And that hurts. When someone who's close to you dies, when, when you grow close to death, the reason that is painful is not simply because death is a loss. It's because it strikes at the very core of the purpose for which you've been created. Like, you exist to show and spread the glory of God, and death comes and says, I'd like to snuff that out. And so it hurts. Sin has frustrated our purpose. I mean, it's frustrated it to, to such a point that up until sin entered into the world, people would have been able to multiply, and as they multiplied, they would fill the earth with more and more images of God that would lead to his glory. But by the time you reach Genesis chapter 6, like you just flip a couple pages over, and you read in Genesis chapter 6 verse 1, when man began to multiply on the face of the land. Oh, they're doing exactly what they ought to do. People are multiplying. They're, they're spreading out over the face of the land. But what is God's evaluation in verse 5? The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. You see, because sin has entered into the world and man is no longer innately good, but innately evil, innately wicked and sinful, as they multiply and fill the earth, instead of the earth being filled with the glory of God, it is filled with wickedness. Sin has frustrated our purpose. But the good news of the gospel 
is that Jesus has, has not only taken our punishment, and he has also redeemed our purpose. You see, the good news of the gospel is that although we have all sinned, although we are all deserving of death and hell, God in his love sent God the Son, Jesus, into the world. And Jesus lived the perfect life we ought to have lived. He never disobeyed. And then Jesus went to a cross and he died to take the punishment for your sin and mine. On the third day, he rose from the dead in victory over sin and death and the devil. He now lives at the right hand of the Father in heaven, offering forgiveness of sins, eternal life, adoption as the children of God to all of those who would stop trusting in who they are and what they've done and instead trust in who Jesus is and what he has done. That is the good news of the gospel. And it is good news. Jesus has taken the punishment for your sin. But I want you to see something that I think gets overlooked often in in the implications of the gospel, and that is that not only has Jesus taken your punishment, he has redeemed your purpose. All of these uh, frustrations with infertility and miscarriage and death, with the fact that we multiply and wickedness seems to multiply, Jesus has come not only to take your punishment, but to redeem your purpose. If you've got your Bible, you can flip with me to Matthew chapter 28. I think we have it up on the screens. We can uh, throw it up there if that's more convenient for you. But there in Matthew chapter 28, after Jesus has risen from the dead, Jesus gathers his followers, and here's what he says to them. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And I want you to see what is happening here. We we call this the Great Commission. And Jesus is saying, look, the, the first Adam, he entered into the world and he was given authority on earth to show and spread the glory of God. But he failed in his purpose when he fell into sin. And all of his descendants since him, you and I, we we've been doing the same. But God the Father gave us a second Adam, Jesus Christ. And Jesus, he didn't fail in his mission. He was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so while the first Adam had authority on earth, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, says, but because I have been victorious, I have not only all authority on earth, I have all authority in heaven and on earth. And I'm going to use that authority to reissue that original command to you to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth with those who would show and spread the glory of God. And you see what Jesus is doing here in the Great Commission. He's taking that that original command, the, the original purpose for which you and I were created, and he says, now let me take the way sin has frustrated that purpose and let me fill it with meaning once again. If you will go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If if you will teach them to observe all that I have commanded you, you will fulfill the very purpose for which you were created, to show and spread the glory of God. In other words, the purpose you and I were created for is to be engaged in evangelism, discipleship. We are to be about speaking of the good news of Jesus Christ to those around us. Evangelism isn't just, you know, something you leave to the experts. Evangelism is for every believer in Jesus Christ. And some of you, I I believe the reason there is depression in your life, I I believe some of you, the reason there's despondency in your life, may be because you are not engaging in the very thing for which you were created. When, when you pull away from evangelism, when you pull away from discipleship, the, the, the reason these things hit you and you feel like, man, nothing I do seems to matter. It's because you've missed the very purpose for which you've been created. Evangelism, discipleship. And some of you are saying, well, hey, whoa, 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 Aaron, you're telling me my purpose is to be a lifelong shill for Jesus Christ? Like, wh- what, what good is in that for me? And so I, I want to take just a few moments here to try to clearly address that concern and show you 
why I find the Bible's answer not only morally satisfying, but personally very fulfilling. You see, in, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 25, Jesus says this. He says, whoever would seek to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, you may have never heard those words in your life. Wh- whoever, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You may have never heard those words before, but those words in that verse, Jesus is telling you what you already know to be true in your heart. That when you seek your purpose in in whatever you want it to be, you just say, look, the purpose in life is whatever I want it to be. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my own purpose. I'm going to seek to save my life, make the most of my life by creating my own meaning. When you do that, you will lose your life. Nothing you ever do will ever give you true satisfaction. You might find little blips where you think, man, I'm, I think I may be happy here. And then like two weeks later, it's gone. And so you try this thing and that thing, and, and you keep searching, trying this. Maybe I'm supposed to do this. Maybe I'm supposed to do that. Maybe, and you keep trying different things, thinking this next thing certainly is going to be what brings me satisfaction and meaning in my life. And yet each time you wind up feeling empty. Why? Because whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. But Jesus says, whoever loses his life for my sake, whoever answers my call to follow me and to be engaged in the work of evangelism and discipleship, that one will find it. And that's true because if the gospel is true, and it is, it means that believers in Jesus Christ, we don't only have this life, we get eternal life. So I I not only get joy in the here and now, I have a great hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Death will not be the last word in my story. That's, that's a good feeling. Not only that, it means that what I do, and it, it doesn't just matter for 20 or 40 or 60 years. I mean, some of you, you're looking at your to-do list and you're thinking, man, none of this really matters. I get up and like Monday, I do the same thing I do every Monday. And, and my, my life, it just seems pointless. Now, I don't want you to mishear me. Some of you are going to think, well, I'm just going to quit my job and go into full-time ministry, and then what I do will matter. That's not what I'm saying. Look, if God's calling you to ministry, I want you to answer, but here's what I am saying. If the gospel is true, and it is, it means everything you do in this life counts for eternity. Because God sees, and God will reward And so what I do this afternoon, if I choose to go home and and sit on the sofa and and watch football and just veg out, ignore my family, tune the whole world out, and I'm just there with the TV, I'm going to receive due result for that in eternity. But if I go home and I say, you know what, Lord, I've worked hard today, I need a little bit of time to rest. And so I'm not going to answer my phone, and I'm not going to answer email, and I'm going to trust that you're going to care for these people while I watch the Patriots lose. Well, then it's an act of worship. (laughs) I'll receive an eternal reward. (laughs) And what I do, and what you do, each and every moment of your life, it matters. You'll be... You will receive a reward or you will forfeit one. And so if you are in a state where you just feel like what you do doesn't matter, if there is a despondency in your life, I would just want to encourage you with this. We have what we call here at Hayes Hills, tell it to two. We want every member of this church praying for the salvation of two non-believers and for opportunities to speak the good news of the gospel to them. And some of you, you've been praying for your two for some time and you haven't said a thing. And I'm telling you, if you were depressed, if you were despondent, I would just challenge you to do this. I I would just say, set an alarm on your phone this week. And when it goes off, you say, I am talking to this person about Jesus. I don't care what I have to do. Like they're, they're talking to me about how to, I don't know, you know, make stew. And I say, hey, have you heard about Jesus? You're going to do whatever it takes to transition the conversation to Jesus. But because if you will tell someone about Jesus this week, I guarantee you it will lift your spirits. You know why? Because there is in each and every one of us a deep desire to make our parents proud. 
And you know that to be true. Some of you, your parents are absent. You still want to make them proud. Some of you, your parents are around, and that's the problem, because when they're around, they, they treat you awfully. And yet you still want to make them proud, and, and it tears you up. You're like, why do I care what this person thinks about me? Why do I want to make them proud? But the reason you feel that way, the reason we all feel that way is because it is a shadow of the real thing. You have been created to please your heavenly Father. You have been created with a deep-seated desire to make him proud, and you will never walk with a greater assurance that, that you have pleased your heavenly Father than when you have spoken to someone of the good news of Jesus Christ. You will walk away from that conversation. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they pray to receive Jesus right there or if they walk away thinking you're a fool. You, you will walk away with a bounce in your step because you can almost hear the Father saying to you, well done, good and faithful servant. You have shown and you have spread the glory of God. So I want to I encourage you, Hazels, to be actively engaged in evangelism. It is the very reason for which you and I were created. And look, I understand there's a lot of angst about that. A lot of us, we're just not used to it. Like evangelism seems like a weird thing that only some Christians do. And, and so it's terrifying. But Lord willing, Lord willing, over the next three weeks, we're going to take some time to think as we walk through God's word, what does it look like to speak about the good news of the gospel? What does it look like to be engaged in evangelism with those around me? And then on October 16th, Saturday morning, we're going to have evangelism training, 9 to 1030. Give me 90 minutes of your time. I promise you, if you walk in on the 16th and you don't have a clue how to share the gospel with anyone, if you don't know how to speak the good news of Jesus Christ, by the time you leave 90 minutes later, you will know how to speak the gospel to those around you, and you will have practiced it several times so that you walk out of there confident. And so I would encourage you, just put on your calendar October 16th, 9 to 10.30 a.m., right here at the church, evangelism training. Because what is the purpose in life? It's this, to show and spread the glory of God. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the good gift of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ask that you would use the good news of the gospel to, to shape us and form us in such a way that Lord, we would reflect your glory to the watching world. I pray, Lord, for those of us who are hesitant to speak of you to others, that by an act of your Holy Spirit, you would embolden us in our witness this week. That you would help us not only to take advantage of the conversations that present themselves, but to also actively seek to create opportunities for those conversations. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
Join me as I pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for the opportunity that you have given us to come into your house, Lord, to praise and worship your holy name, Lord, and just have the opportunity to hear your word, Lord. Lord, I thank you for the many blessings that you have given us, and I uh, just pray that you bless this, the portion that we return to you, Lord. Lord, that, it, that we are uh, reminded of our purpose uh, to, to reflect your glory to those around us and to spread your message, Lord. And I just pray that you bless this offering as it is used to spread your word to our neighbors and the nations. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want to thank you again for worshiping with us today here at Hayes Hills, and I want to remind you that tonight at 6 o'clock, we're going to have a members meeting right here, and uh, if you're a member, you're, you're certainly encouraged to be here. If you're not a member, I want, to, want you to know you are welcome. Uh, in fact, before I joined the church, I would want to attend a members meeting and see how a church does its business. I think you can tell a lot about a church uh, from those conversations and how they operate. And so right here tonight, 6 o'clock, we'll have a members meeting. Um, the main topic of discussion tonight is going to be a proposal that's coming from the elders and the administration committee to create a new position that would be minister of children and administration. Hopefully you've been able to see something of that in the newsletter. And um, the idea is to actually add some additional hours on top of a minister of children that would meet a couple of needs, not only uh, children's ministry, uh, but also to assist with some administrative tasks, take a few things off of my plate. And so um, we want you to come tonight at six o'clock. We'll be kind of sharing the vision for that. We've got a unique candidate that we think fits uh, both of these, and we'll be visiting more about that possibility. And then um, the church will have an opportunity to say, yes, we'd like to continue to pursue that, or no, you know, we'd like to, we'd like to wait and kind of think about this some more. And so I encourage you to be here tonight, 6 o'clock, as we uh, present that proposal. Uh, then I want to encourage you, uh, Thursday, September 30th, it's a Thursday night, uh, 7 p.m., is True Choice Pregnancy Resources uh, Center's annual fundraising banquet. And we're going to be hosting a simulcast event uh, here on our campus. I serve on the board of True Choice. Uh, many of our members are actively uh, serving their wonderful ministry, trying to encourage um, mothers and fathers at a very vulnerable time in their life to choose life for their child and uh, to learn of eternal life that's available to them in Jesus Christ. And uh, so many things I'm excited about. We've got a mobile unit that is almost paid for and complete that'll be driving around uh, Buda and Kyle parking in uh, parking lots. Uh, has an ultrasound uh, on it so that women can hear their uh, child's heartbeat and uh, hopefully get to uh, see the baby and um, be encouraged to choose life. Uh, and then also working to construct um, a nice state-of-the-art clinic in the medical district there in San Marcos. And I think that's going to give us tremendous credibility in the community to be in the medical district with a nice uh, up-to-date clinic. And so you'll get to hear more about that and all the Lord is doing through that ministry Thursday night, uh, 7 o'clock. We'll have child care available as long as you register in advance. I would encourage you to use the Church Center app. You can go online and register and we'll have child care for you. Uh, and then I just want to encourage you, we, we still are in need of some additional help to make Awana happen on Wednesday nights. And for our Awana program to be successful and to be able to continue through the fall, uh, we really need some additional uh, handbook leaders. What we need you to do is, at a minimum, if you could give us 645 to 720 on Wednesday nights to be able to listen to children as they recite scripture to you, I promise you'll be blessed by that experience. If you've been a member for at least six months, as you can understand, we, wanna, uh, we don't want to just put strangers in uh, with our most vulnerable uh, children. We want to have some time to be able to vet people's character. But if you've been a member at least six months, uh, we'd love to be able to visit with you about uh, how you could serve in the Awana ministry on Wednesday evenings. You can email children at hayeshills.com to get more information about how to, how to get hooked up with our Awana ministry. Thank you for being here this morning. I look forward to seeing you again this evening. If you would stand, we're going to sing our closing song, and then you'll be sent out to speak the good news of the gospel to a world that desperately needs to hear it. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. 
Praise Him, O creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 